Hello everyone and hello everyone, sorry. Welcome to your State Library at Home. My name's Sam Hagen and I manage public programs at the State Library of New South Wales. I'd like to begin this evening as we always do by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are all separately but collectively standing this evening and pay my respects to elders past, present and of course emerging. This evening, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce my colleague, Dr. Rachel Franks. Rachel is the coordinator of scholarship at the library, and she's also a conjoint fellow at the University of Newcastle. Rachel has completed extensive research on crime fiction and true crime. And I am lucky enough to be able to mine Rachel's brain in person whenever I need any crime fiction recommendations. But for those of you who aren't as lucky, you can also find her work in a wide variety of books, journals, magazines, and on social media. So tonight, Rachel will be talking to us about classic crime texts, some of which have strong links to the collection at the library. There'll be a bit of time at the end for you to ask any questions that you might have of Rachel. So please do jump onto the Q&A function if the mood takes you. But for now, I'm gonna ask Rachel to join us. Rachel, can you hear me? Hi Sam. Hi. See ya. I too would like to begin by acknowledging that I live, work and write on Gadigal land. As I try to tread lightly on country, I pay my sincere respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal Australians who might be in the audience tonight. Thank you very much for coming to talk about crime fiction and true crime in the middle of a pandemic. Now, crime stories in the middle of a global crisis might not sound like an obvious reading choice, but it is crime stories with all the terror and the violence and the feelings of discomfort and fear that they can generate that are the stories which can help to restore our faith in society, to reassure us that the world will at some point write itself. One of my favourite books is P.D. James talking about detective fiction, and it has one of my favourite quotes about the genre. It's a slim volume and a great snapshot of why crime fiction is so popular. And I want to share this quote with you. So P.D. James is talking about worlds full of anxiety and tension and, and uncertainty. And she writes, and here in the detective story, we have a problem at the heart of the novel and one which is solved not by luck or by divine intervention, but by human ingenuity, human intelligence and human courage. It confirms our hope that despite some evidence to the contrary, we live in a beneficent and moral universe in which problems can be solved by rational means and peace and order restored from communal or personal disruption and chaos. Yes, we learn about society. Uh, we travel to different places, to different time frames, and we occasionally in crime fiction fall a little bit in love with cranky officers of the law. But we usually end up with an answer to a puzzle. And that's one of the important things, and that's what James is writing about when she's talking about those resolutions that, that we rely on, that we actually turn to actively in crime fiction. Now, crime fiction is actually the world's largest genre. Almost one in every three new books published in English every year fall under the category of crime. So where would you start? For me, in times of uncertainty, when the world feels a little bit upside down, I actually take a lot of enjoyment from rereading, going back to books that I know well or knew well once upon a time. So this is a great book for rereading. This is a facsimile edition of the first UK uh, issue of Agatha Christie's A Body in the Library, which came out in 1942. It's my favourite Christie cover, it's so beautiful. And it really showcases that she was a lot more innovative than people give her credit for, you know, soft scenes of country estates on book covers, that sort of thing. And in this book, 
which stars Miss Jane Marple, she actually plays around with her critics and she toys with some of the cliches of the genre. A bit of a, I can do this and I actually can do it really well. She certainly was doing something right. So she published 66 novels of detective fiction plus 14 volumes of short crime stories uh, between 1920 and the first appearance of The Mysterious Affair at Stiles and 1976 and Miss Marple's last appearance in Sleeping Murder. Across that canon, she sold two billion books, which must irritate her critics no end. I think only the Bible and Shakespeare have actually outdone Agatha Christie as far as publishing statistics go. And I think this book is particularly important in a pandemic. And I chose this to start with because she does have so many books in print. Her books are absolutely everywhere. And as we read for connections to characters, to situations, to authors, we also read to connect to each other. And while many of us are working at home or staying home, we don't have those little serendipitous excursions out where we might see somebody who's reading a book that we've read or we're about to read. Those little moments of connection that we have with random strangers. Well, you can get that with an Agatha Christie because whenever you read a Christie, you know that you're not alone. Someone else somewhere has probably more than one of her books on their shelf and they're probably reading a Christie. Now, I think it's important to acknowledge that when we're feeling overwhelmed, we might not want to sit down and face a novel. It might seem like too much hard work. So I found this book, this is a cracker. This is Biblio Mysteries, Stories of Crime in the World of Books and Bookstores. It's been edited by Otto Penzler, who's one of the Joe Cools of crime fiction. He's published and he's anthologised and he's done so much to promote the value of crime fiction stories. And I think that anthologies are really good because there are lots of them available. And this one I quite like because of the book theme. But you can find a set of short crime stories that revolves around any type of activity that you're particularly interested in. Now, I can't really talk about crime fiction without mentioning Peter Corus. This might be a little bit glossy. He's got a little bit of a Mylar jacket to protect him. So this is a first edition, which is one of the joys in my collection. So Peter Corus is often considered the godfather of contemporary Australian crime writing. And this, The Dying Trade, is the first crime novel he wrote. It came out in 1980. And it sparked not only his own career as a crime writer, but encouraged lots of other people to take up crime writing. And we see a, a real renaissance from the 1980s in Australian crime writing. Now, Corus was an absolute machine. So I remember him speaking at a conference I was at many years ago now, and he was describing very casually that he would write a Cliff Hardy novel in the morning. That was all good, you know, work away on that. Then he'd go downstairs and he'd have some lunch and he'd work on a Ray Crawley novel in the afternoon. And for him, there was the joy of writing, but it was also hard work and it was a discipline. And you see that, um, the fruits of that in, in his books. Uh, his, many of his papers are actually in the collections at the State Library of New South Wales and they're quite lovely because even though he has this um, reputation as being this completely industrial writer, you see in his papers a very human writer, you know, the thought process, struggling to get the right word in the right place and he also argues with his editors about italics just like the rest of us do. And I also want to mention this book. So this is going back a little bit further in time. This is Red Harvest. So this was written by DeShiel Hammett to launch his hard-boiled detective, The Continental Op, in 1929. 
So this is the novel version. He did serialise most of his books in magazines prior to them coming out as a single volume. Now, the Continental Op is really an interesting guy. He is not a glamorous law enforcer by any description. He's older, he's overweight, he gets beaten up really badly. But he's so interesting because we never really know that much about him. We don't even know his name. He is just an operative for the Continental Detective Agency. Every now and then he gets called Mr. Continental because he's considered to be such a company man towing the old man's line. Uh, as a detective. But it's because he's anonymous that I think, particularly now, he is so important. So if we go back to that P.D. James idea of needing somebody to solve the crime, to solve the puzzle, to be that rational person, sometimes it can be a little bit hard to, to pin your hopes on somebody that you've never met. The Continental Op, in his anonymity, allows us to believe in a concept as much as we believe in an individual or a specific character. So he's working away in what's basically a pretty corrupt world, and not everything he does is above the law, but he symbolises that hard-boiled tradition. This is a book full of lots of action, lots of bodies, great dialogue. If you like Hard Boiled and you haven't read Red Harvest, um, it's one that I can heartily endorse. Now, of course, we have crime fiction, but we also have the increasingly popular type of writing of true crime. Now, true crime can be a little bit more con controversial and it can make us feel much more uncomfortable we're often forced by true crime, much more so than we are with crime fiction, to think about really complicated issues about what actually is criminal in the first place. How do we punish people who threaten our safety or the safety of society? And the other key thing about true crime is that the endings are not necessarily as neat. There isn't that tidy assembly of suspects in the library brought together, ready for the great denouement. Often the punishment and the spectacle of punishment in true crime is much more drawn out. And you see many more of the complications about punishment. There's no neat end paper or fade to black. So this book that I'd like to talk about first is Hell's Gates, the true Tasmanian story of escaped convicts in Tasmania who um, turned to cannibalism to survive. So written by Paul Collins, who does a really terrific job of bringing Alexander Pierce to life. So Pierce is the focus of this band of convicts and the only survivor out of a gang of cannibals. Now, when Pierce was first transported to Australia, he was done in for stealing shoes. So he's not really your stereotypical bad guy, but as he's incarcerated in Van Diemen's land, you see the brutality of that system change him and turn him into something that is so radically different to what he was before those, those prison experiences. Now, Colin's work is really well researched and it's really well written. It elevates Pierce above the famous line from his confession, which is held at the State Library, that when he was describing human flesh, he says, and it tasted very much like pork. So it's sort of coming to our literature. He was immortalised as the character Gabbett in Marcus Clarke's For the Term of His Natural Life. And often we don't see Pierce beyond that single line of text. And this book actually allows us to see him as a person, which is really quite important. It's also an absolutely stunning um, television adaptation. If you have the opportunity to see it on film, um, I would suggest that you take that up. But just a little bit of a, a heads up, the sound effects of cannibals having dinner out in the wilderness might be a little bit too realistic for some viewers. 
Another confession that we have in the library is the confession of John Natchbull. Now, this is a man who is a textbook of bad decision making. He was born into a world of privilege and he had every opportunity possible provided to him. But if he had a fork in the road and there was a decent option and a really terrible option, without fail, Natchbull would take the really terrible option until in 1844, He's engaged to be married. He realises, oh, hang on, I actually don't have enough money to pay for the ceremony. So he robs a shop here in Sydney. And in the process, he kills the shopkeeper with a tomahawk. He's found guilty and he's executed for his crime. He's hanged outside Darlinghurst Jail in one of the biggest mass gatherings that Colonial Sydney ever saw. And his confession and his story is told in this book, John Natchbull by Colin Roderick. And this is a really interesting volume because if you look at the archival material, if you look at the, the points in Natchbull's lifetime, you would think he's not a man you could feel sorry for. But Roderick actually offers a really sympathetic account in 1963, well after the, the initial horror of the crime has passed. But it is a fascinating insight into how our views of crime can change over time. Another book that deals with quite sensitive issues is this work by Alicia Simmons, Wild Man. Now this looks at a more recent case. So this investigates a coronial inquest that um, happened after police in New South Wales shot a man and killed him in 2012. And it talks about how sometimes those people that would appear to be wanting to do us the most harm are in some ways victims themselves. And Alicia is an historian and she's also a lawyer. So she brings a really interesting combination of expertise to discussing true crime. And she makes a beautiful point in her book about facing the archive and the stories of criminals as well as of victims. And she says of the boxes that she's pulled out to look at, it is tall and rectangular like a crypt and like a crypt, it holds the tantalizing promise of secrets. When I thought about Evan's story, I set it in a midnight world of dark subterranean forces. Yet here it is before me, anemic and brittle, sucked of life, a biography written by bureaucracy. And so if you ever doubt your attraction to true crime, you can always fall back on those words and the idea that somebody is being given a real voice they're not just a newspaper headline or a line in a police report. Now, like crime fiction, sometimes you don't want to sit in front of a few, uh, full volume of true crime either. So true crime and poetry isn't necessarily an obvious combination, but this book by Ross Gibson, he makes it work. It's so unusual, but it's fascinating. So this is the criminal re-register and it's a set of poems by Gibson. So Gibson came across a 1957 issue of the criminal register. This is an old fashioned book that used to be produced every year in December. And it was basically a book of crooks for coppers. It's like a who's who of who we need to watch out for when we're doing the beat. And he found that and he wrote poetry about the profiles in it and the themes that came forward for him, the treatment of women, the stereotyping of immigrant men, all sorts of things. It is stunning and it's so beautiful and there's a little bit of magic in it because it's actually really quirky. Now, the last book I'd like to mention tonight is Judith Flanders, The Invention of Murder, how the Victorians reveled in death and detection and created modern crime. So I've actually been suggesting this book to people since it first came out nearly 10 years ago. Now, crime stories have always been with us and today it feels like they're absolutely everywhere. 
In this book, Flanders tells us about the important history of the explosion of true crime and crime fiction and the popularity of these stories across the 1800s. And this is a really vital history as we can, as I've mentioned, feel uneasy about reading these stories. There's a sense that we're seeking entertainment through somebody else's tragedy and misfortune. But these stories are more than that. They are facilitating important conversations between our own internal selves and with others about crime, how it changes, how we should punish and how much we should punish. This is a recurring thing in true crime, particularly. Now, this isn't to say that these stories are straightforward. And there's this fantastic example in Flanders' book where she's talking about the murder of William Ware in England in 1823. And it was the sensational story. Everyone was obsessed with what was happening. People were paying other people to go and sit in the courtroom and write down what was happening and then courier it to them so that they didn't have to wait for the newspapers to come out. But the newspapers were really onto it. And Flanders writes, the Chronicle calculated that over the two days of the trial, there were a hundred horses reserved to carry the reports from Hartford by express to feed the insatiable demand. And I love this example because I can see those horses. I can hear the noise and smell the chaos of horses everywhere and newspaper boys and people trying to load these animals and split them off into all these different directions. And so it's a fantastic visual of how crime is messy, but telling and consuming crime stories is messy as well. The most important thing to remember about crime fiction and true crime is if you're reading a book and it doesn't suit you, you don't like it for whatever reason, you don't have to finish it. There are so many titles to choose from and to explore that it's easy to just find something else. And that great icon of crime fiction, Dorothy L. Sayers, wrote about how much stuff was available in the late 1920s. She said, it is impossible to keep track of all the detective stories produced today. Book upon book, magazine upon magazine, pour out from the press, crammed with murders, thefts, arsons, frauds, conspiracies, problems, puzzles, mysteries, thrills, maniacs, crooks, poisoners, forgers, garrotters, police, spies, secret servicemen, detectives, until it seems that half the world must be engaged in setting riddles for the other half to solve. And certainly since the 1980s and the desire for more in-depth accounts of true crime, the full-length true crime narrative has also been readily available. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was great, really interesting. And I've actually got a couple of questions here for you from some of our viewers, friends. Um, one person asks, what are the ethics around crime fiction? Or what are the, sorry, not ethics, what are the issues around crime fiction? Um, possibly the way we treat women. So the way we stereotype women as either really good or really villainous, there doesn't often seem to be a middle ground where women are allowed to be as complex as the crimes that either they commit or as those crimes that are committed around them. And those stereotypes have, have morphed into true crime in many ways. And we see those same sort of patterns emerge. And also with crime fiction, you don't really see it in true crime, but with novels such as going back to DeShiel Hammett's The Thin Man or Miles Franklin's Bring the Monkey, you laugh often a lot. And sometimes that's really disconcerting. You know, this is murder is very serious business. You're not supposed to laugh about that. But in crime fiction, sometimes it, it happens and it 
takes you by surprise. And I think some readers need to prepare for that. Yeah, that, I can imagine that would be quite interesting. <laughs> <It's been strong. laughs> um, I have got a question here also. Do you know the name or the story of the first true crime, mo I suppose, I mean, tr modern true crime book? So most people give credit to Truman Capote and In Cold Blood, which was serialised and then published as a novel in 1966. And it's the story of a quadruple homicide in Holcomb, Kansas, that really took America by storm. And people were obsessed with this, this case. And um, Hickok and Perry, I think, were the, the names of the murderers. But you can actually trace the long form uh, of true crime further back. There's a, a story about 40 years earlier, an American tragedy. And of course, in the mid 1800s, Edgar Allan Poe, who did so much for crime fiction, was also starting to reinvent true crime, take it out of broadsides and broadsheets and make it stories that people wanted to pay to read and keep. That's, I, I didn't think you'd know that. <laughs> I was like, how would you know what the first one is? But of course you do, because you're a specialist. Um, someone is asking, do you think that the context that a book is written in, particularly geographical context, significantly affects the type of crime novel that's produced? Oh, that's a great question. Mm, especially so when you think about Scandi Noir. Yeah, I think... Um, it's kind of interesting, and I think it crosses over into true crime as well, because, of course, writers and journalists, they're not outside of the societies that we live in. They're part of it, and they're impacted by it as much as any of us. There's a really great quote in Val McDermott's newest book, Let the Dead Speak, and to paraphrase Val McDermott, which sounds terrible but I'll give it a go. She talks about how societies get the crimes they deserve. So if you have a society based on misogyny that doesn't value what women contribute to that society, then you're going to have a society dominated by sex crimes. And she talks about capitalism and how if winning at all costs is all that matters. If the person with the most money at the end of the day is the person that wins, then fraud and embezzlement and those sorts of crimes will, will, will start to dominate what's happening around us. I really like that theory. Is that a popular theory? Well, it is now. Falmer <laughs> has said it. How is it not popular? <laughs> Um, okay, back to the questions, not just my personal questions. Um, <laughs> Rachel, I've got here, why do you think that crime is so often not seen as on par with literary fiction? Oh. <laughs> Contentious. <laughs> it is. It's very controversial. So um, Charles Graeber talks about this and he, he sort of says that the term literary crime fiction and literary true crime is gaining currency, but it's not really a genuine effort to redeem either genre. And, you know, I think that if you want to use labels, and I don't necessarily like using labels, but if you find them useful, if you think of the idea that little l literature reminds us of what we already know, and big L literature teaches us something new, then how is it that one book is either little L or big L for all people? Because depending on what we need at any time when we're reading, depending on where we are when we read a text, will influence what we take out of that. And sometimes, you know, relearning something or being reminded of something is derided in literature but sometimes those old lessons are the most valuable and the most reassuring. And crime is about reassuring us. And that's part of why cold cases can make us so obsessive because there's no one to blame. There's no neat or extended narrative of punishment that lets us say, oh, I've had closure. And it's only one small part of the world that small part has been resolved. 
Thanks, Rachel. Um, someone else has asked, uh, you've discussed Christie, and are there any other golden age authors that you would recommend? There's so many. I quite like um, Dorothy L. Sayers. Um, she writes really quite sophisticated, very much more beautiful language than Christie. So Christie is often, you know, she gets criticised because her um, characters are quite two dimensional, but that's very deliberate. Everybody is a suspect. Apart from the detective, everybody in a Christie novel could have done it. Whereas um, Dorothy L. Sayers is a bit more nuanced and she wants to leave clues and little bits of the character to trail. She wants us to be able to solve the crime alongside her detective. Whereas Chris, she doesn't care if we don't solve it. She just wants to sell another book. Um, Nio Marsh, a New Zealand writer from the same era, all sorts of really lovely books that she wrote, many of them set in the theatre. So that's one of the great things about crime fiction as well, is that if you're interested in something else, you can find a crime writer who exploits that environment because we're all told, write about what you know. And we like to think that our writers don't actually know firsthand about murder. So they just put murders into spaces that they do know really well. And that can be really interesting and it can be quite an um, enjoyable aspect of reading a crime story. This is a, a bit of a personal one for you. It says, how and when did you fall in love with crime fiction slash true crime? Um, so when I was a teenager, so the first crime book I remember reading um, was The Big Sleep, Raymond Chandler. And it's completely bonkers. You know, sometimes you really don't know what's going on. Sometimes you're certain that he doesn't really know what's going on. But it's this amazing language. And it's this idea that crime really is anywhere. You know, these alleyways and um, the city getting lost in the streets and men in trench coats. So it was such a different environment to what I was growing up with. I felt quite transported for that. And I read crime fiction for many, many years. And I actually thought I was one of these people, I will never read true crime. If I want to do true crime, I will watch the six o'clock news. But several years ago, I started thinking about what makes a difference? What stories can we learn from that actually change the world that we live in? And true crime can do that for us. You know, we can have a full length book that changes police procedures or policies that has enough people and enough momentum behind it to say how we address this particular issue now is wrong. And so I think that that's a type of writing that not many other genres are able to give us. It's true. I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, here's, here's one that we might have to end on, and I'm not sure, it's kind of putting you on the spot, but someone says, can you read one of the poems from Ross Gibson's book? I'll read a fragment of a poem. I won't read it as well as, um, um, as Ross would. He has a, if you've ever heard him speak, he has a very lovely voice. So I've literally just opened it randomly. 45 years, five feet, eight inches, thick set build, medium complexion, fair hair, blue eyes, top joints of three fingers missing on left hand, burn scars on fingers of right hand and a long inside right forearm and upper arm, shrapnel scars on left hip and leg, native of Katoomba, labourer, thief, Thank you so much. Uh, that's all we've got time for. But I can tell you that people really enjoyed themselves tonight. <laughs> Lots of discussion. Um, I, of course, would like to thank you and say that hopefully I'll see you soon in person. But otherwise, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. 
do keep an eye on the State Library website for upcoming uh, author events and other events. We have a lot of things going on at the moment. So please visit the website www.sl.nsw.gov.au and hopefully we will see you back here in this virtual space very soon. Have a lovely evening. Good night. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, everybody.